personal attention today, since there's not many of us here. I know the, the name can be kind of misleading, but basically, we're going to talk to a lot, a lot about data mining for an open source tool. Um, just want to welcome you all to uh, creating fat polygons with nine. Um, we're going to be going into more of that. Um, my name is Skip Daniels, or Anthony Skip Daniels. I'm a GI software, uh, software developer and analyst for Forsyth County, um, working for Mac Forsyth. Done a lot of applications starting off with Engine on desktop since 2005. Um, doing uh, basically migrating off of that, still doing desktop stuff with, to the, uh, with Engine, but uh, going into web development right now uh, for the last couple of years. Um, Mark introduced me to Nine about two years ago, and uh, it was like a just a light went off. So if any of y'all have to really manipulate data or find data from multiple spots, and just a big light went off. Now, this is my colleague here, Mark Cook. Who was introduced? Uh, Mark Cook. I work for Tax Management Associates or TMA. Uh, we are a NIME trusted partner. Um, NIME is based over in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, we happened to find them about three and a half years ago. Um, went down the path of becoming a trusted partner um, for their organization. And then I went on and became a NIME trusted instructor. Um, so I have the ability to train um, as well as do the, the consulting work around the NIME workflows. So Steve and I have been working together for the last couple of years putting together some interesting stuff, and then he had this idea about building fat polygons, so we, we went down the road of building a, a demonstration project around that. You know, I'm in the GIS world, you know, most everything you're going to tie your data to is a polygon. And yes, you can join them and stuff like that, but what happens if you have to share it to with your colleagues? You know, usually some of this joint data can't be shared because you're the only one access to the other data. So, you know, when Mark showed me NIME, I was like, man, fat polygons. I can sit there and build these polygons up, make them any flavor I want with what data needs to go into it, and then I can share them off to my colleagues or whoever needs them, instead of trying to show them how to, okay, well, the join broke. i got to go help you with that. But um, taking, what we're going to show you today is basically taking a the tax polygon, the base of every piece of property in Forsyth County, and showing you what you can do with it. But this is just a small part of what NIME can do. Like Mark said, he's a NIME instructor. There's, it doesn't have to be GIS. You'll see once we get into this, and see how many lights really go off, what you can do with data. Go ahead, Mark. Um, so just a brief background on NIME. NIME is a, what I like to call a data agnostic analytics platform. Um, it doesn't care where the data comes from. It doesn't care what the data is. Right? We can be reading from SQL stores, flat files, XML. Um, we can do remote calls to HTML resources. It really doesn't care what the data is. In fact, it was designed to bring in data from everywhere. Um, we're also part of the, the quick introduction. It's probably the fastest introduction to NIME that I've ever done, um, sort of the 15-minute overview. But you'll get to see that in a single workflow environment, which is one analytical area, you can read in data from all of those repositories, combine them, run the analytics on them, and then push it out either to reporting that we're all familiar with, um, tangible reports like PDFs, et cetera, that might be shipped off via email or other avenues, or um, pushing the analytics results and the visualizations up to um, web pages, HTML resources, that type of thing. So it's a lot um, to kind of consume, but I think we've broken it down into some chunks. In order to get through the introduction to show you what we've done on the, the level of the GIS polygons. Because this is for state and local government, it's very exciting to be able to look at um, the, the concept of how many different data repositories we have sitting out there right now in siloed uh, repositories, accessing those, bringing them into one analytical environment in order to drive decision making, um, allocation of resources, whatever it might be um, that's going to drive some of our judgments and some of our experience around the government space. Can I add one more thing? Sure. Good thing about nine, it 
It's open source. It's built on, now I don't know how much you all know about development or anything, but it's built on Eclipse, Java Eclipse. It runs on all, almost every flavor operating system. And anybody knows anything about Eclipse, it's a well-sounded foundation. Seldom ever crashes. It's just well-rounded. And the good thing else, the install, there is no install. It's back to like Windows 3.11. It's compartmentized. It doesn't go to your operating system. It all runs in its own directory. So I mean, just throw a little IT into that part there. And that's what I really love about it too. I mean, it doesn't get into your Windows operating system and then you have to go, oh shoot, I don't have the right to do this or that or whatever. It's its own little monster. It runs locally. Um, and the other side, it is a small group. Um, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. There's no <coughs> standard to this particular presentation. Um, so if you have some more technical minded questions about how it runs or how it operates, we're happy to answer those. Uh, so what you're looking at is the NIME workbench. This is what runs locally. It's part of the open source release. Um, I'll give you the, the quick rundown because I know it looks kind of alien at the moment. Um, but if you've done anything on the Eclipse platform, it probably looks a little bit familiar at least. But on the left hand side we have a, a directory structure, basically a file structure for where I can go and get um, workflows. Workflows are the analytical areas where I do my work. The center piece is actually a workflow that I've built in two different processes to go over some of the basic introductions of what I'm capable of. Um, as Skip was alluding, so I've got everything in, in a local file structure. Right? I can go through any of these and actually package them up. They're just flat files, basically config files for nine behind the scenes. But it allows me to keep them all um, structured as organized. The other nice thing is I can export these, since they are flat files, into a very small file base and ship it over to Skip. He can then expand that into his workspace and look at the, the process that I've put together. So it allows some sharing around analytical capabilities and, and sharing resources. That gets expanded um, through the NIME server, but this is going to be more about what's capable, what's possible in the open source package. Um, just to point out for those of you that may be taking notes, the standard release also uh, has free access to the NIME.org example files. So when you're trying to build a workflow, you can log into their example server and then do the same thing, download uh, workflows that they've already built around particular areas and it gives you kind of a bootstrap into how you might actually want to accomplish things. What about the two books? And there, there have been a couple of books published. They're, they're really good. Yeah. Um, you can get the way we purchase them. You can buy them one time or add a few more dollars to it and you get a three year subscription to it. So every time they update nine and they update the books, they'll send it to you and you get the data with it. I mean, it's great tutorials. That's what really got me going even more, showing you different things, how to, each node works and everything. So. Yep. Um, everything can be found at nine.org. <coughs> N-I-N-E.org. And also with uh, YouTube. Yes, and they have a wonderful YouTube channel with lots of examples. Um, just giving you some more feel, there are uh, the workflows, you can open multiple workflows. These are just tab workflows. We're going to go through most of these um, over the, the next few minutes. The workflow area where you actually build things, it is a GUI interface um, in NIME that, that gives a leg up for most of us, right? It's not required that you have any linear programming knowledge in order to be able to use some of these advanced um, tools for extracting data, for Manipulating data, or as we'll see in a second, even doing some higher level machine learning, machine learning algorithms. Um, it is a click and drag. Um, you, know, you configure inside of each node, which we'll also go through. Just so, like model builder and GIS. Yeah. Um, there are a number of these workflow type um, applications that are available. This one's just geared towards the data analytics. <coughs> the console I keep open because it helps me debug the process if something breaks. That's down at the bottom. And then they have this handy node description, um, which is that for every node in the library, they went ahead and built a, a description of that node, which displays when you click on the node. So it's kind of like having a heads up help directory um, built in. So I usually keep that on the side. 
just in case I need some additional information. The nodes, um, these little boxes, uh, are the ones that do everything. nodes do all of the hard work in NIME. They have nodes that are segmented for each particular purpose. There are about 800 nodes now in the NIME library. This is your node library tree. Um, the way that you find them is you can either type into the search box to grab them, um, or you can file through the directory tree. The nice side uh, to NIME is that because it's open source, it also means that you can have community contributions. So if somebody builds something that they think is really nice, they can put it under a GPL license and allow the, the NIME community access to it. The Polygon nodes that we're going to get to um, for this presentation are actually under that community contributions, meaning that a third party like our company that uses NIME on a regular basis built nodes around the Esri file structure and then shipped them out to the, the NIME community to allow them to use it. Um, there are nodes for just about everything. So there are nodes to interact with Google APIs, there are nodes to interact with RESTful data structures. There are nodes to extract from all sorts of data repositories out there. To do statistics um, for people that have to do statistical reporting, um, as well as doing some of these higher level machine learning type uh, algorithms. So as we try to do predictive modeling, right? that's part of what NIME has been built for, is to be able to build some predictive platforms, which I've also got a brief workflow to go into how that fits into the, the world of the, that polygon. In other words, we can build predictive polygons at the end of the day so that we can look, say, six months or 12 months or 18 months into the future to see what our landscape might look like in the, in the environment. So just any questions at this point? Keep rolling on. Okay. Um, what you're seeing here is just a very simple workflow um, to give you an idea of some of the, the data manipulation that NIME can do. These are file reader nodes. They're reading from flat files. In this case, it's just a simple text file that has usernames in it as they would be given to you in a list. Right? So the simple task. For us, from an IT perspective, is you've got to take this list and you've got to turn it into an actual distribution list for email addresses, or at least that's the example workflow. So I can run through pretty quickly in NIME with the, this is called the cell splitter, so I'm going to split off the username from the actual name. I'm going to clean the strings up with a couple of the string manipulation nodes. I can split the cells and then add the domain. That's what each of these is doing to sort of get through the workflow um, and filter off some of the things that I don't need. And at the end of that process, what I have is a string instead in a single column that looks like the, the kind of input that we use Google Apps to host our email account. So this is the kind of input that Google Apps likes to have for input on email addresses, going from just this name, username, to an actual string manipulated output. That's not very exciting, but I wanted to give you an idea of some of the ways that NIME works. So I've got this file reader node, I just pointed at a file through the configuration settings. Something like the cell splitter, when you double click on it, it just opens a dialog. You tell it what you want to split on, how you want to um, aggregate the data at the end, whether or not you want to put it in a new column, all that kind of stuff. And everything in NIME works along those lines. Is there anybody that's familiar with R? Not really. R is a language for statistical computing. Um, it's a linear programming language. It's become really popular too because it's also open source. Um, 
even when we want to integrate with, for the people that are technically minded, if you want to integrate with NIME, I mean, if you want to integrate with R, um, Python, Java, JavaScript, there are nodes to support injecting that linear programming language in the workflow. So that simply looks like basically a very slimmed down version of an IDE or, or a development environment that opens up and you can insert your code from the coding language and now it knows to interpret that in the correct way in order to do what it needs to do with the data. Does that make sense so far? We're just doing some simple text manipulation. We do it through the nodes. The upside to a process like this is that traditionally if you're doing this in a language, you manipulate the data um, as you go, right? So if I want to think about doing something like this in Excel um, on the most basic level or even in a database structure um, on a more complex level, I am manipulating the data as I go. If I make a mistake, then I have to restore my data back. Hopefully I've kept a backup copy and I restore my data back to the beginning point and I start to work forward again. The nice thing about NIME is that each node saves the process. So it saves all of the data up to it. So we'll play in this one, uh, in this particular workflow. If I get to a point where I say I didn't really like what I did in this step, I just go back and change that step nothing before it changes and everything after it is already programmed to do the same thing going forward. So I go back, I change that one item in the step and I just re-execute it. So that's a great thing I love about Nine. You know, I've made mistakes joining data before, I did the wrong type of join or anything else. And you know, if you do it in SQL, which you can, you don't see it until the end. And just like Mark said, you already changed the data. Here, you can stop at each node and see what the data looks like from what you did the manipulation on. It will show you. So you look at it and go, well, I did the wrong join. So I fix it, fix that one, run it again. Yeah, that's the right join. Then you go on from there. It, like I said, it will show you the data at each point of what you've done to it. Other than programming languages or SQL, which you, you know, like you said, you don't see until the end unless you got a bug in it. And that's what, that's like I said, he's showing you right there, that's what I love about Nine, that you can really play. Well, if I did this to it, what will happen? Well, you can see it. And like I said, if you make a mistake, Mark said, you know, it stop, you can stop the data from the note before that you know you did right. And everything else is gone. The, the workflows, obviously, you save them too, so following on Skip's point, the nice thing about it is that you recall these so a process that you might do in Excel, basic level of process <coughs> that might get repeated over and over again, usually a human being has to understand that process and then they have to start from the raw data and they run through the steps to manipulate the data all the way to the end. You save something like the nine workflow, you just point it at a new file. So whatever file needs to be processed through that same method, it just gets pointed at a new file and it processes through and drops out the results. It does understand things like loop structures too, so there's ways to program loops into NIME. <coughs> if you had 100 Excel files all in a directory that need to be manipulated the same way, or tables across a SQL infrastructure that all need to be updated with the, the same type of information, you can use those loop control structures to just start a process that's going to run and hit every endpoint that you pointed at. Make sense? Um, so the data that I pulled up for this other simple example workflow is some crime data um, that I pulled down from a public resource. This is what it looks like in the format that the flat file is provided in the data download. Using the NIME process, I can extract, it understands date time structures in the same way that SQL data structures understand date time, right? It, it understands that it's a date field. So I just tell it which field is the date field. Um, in this case, I cleaned up the um, types of crimes using a logical structure. This little rule engine is pretty powerful um, tool for being able to manipulate data because it will allow me to just create a rule structure. I don't know if you can even see that from the back, but I basically say if the description has this term in it, we're going to 
transform it to this other term. Um, that allows me to keep the entire um, data structure uniform. It allows me to also clean up data. You can do things like address parsing through the um, rule node because it, it will follow those uh, rules and parse the data appropriately. We can take a branch off of a particular workflow. So each, each endpoint connector can go to as many other branches as you like. And you'll see that get a little more complex when we start talking about polygons. In this case, I wanted to see crime, had the number of crimes by category. Um, this data was from 2013. So I just used the group by node, have a group on the categories and give me back a count. Right? So if you're going to do basic statistics, et cetera, I can do this and get my counts. I can pipe that out to a report on the back end. Um, the group by is just a branch off, so continuing along the same main trunk, if you will. I can extract the months. I can add in this nominal value, and this is where we'll show going back and picking a new category. You need to do this over and over again. So if I'm just interested in gun crimes, at the moment, I've got that category included. I exclude all the other categories. Uh, I can then group on the number of gun crimes per month in order just to pull out those counts. And once again, these are very, very simple examples. Um, but I can then use some of the visualization nodes to then create some visualizations that once again will get typed out to, to charts. That's the number of crimes per month. After I've run this kind of analysis, if I want to go back to the nominal value row filter and remove gun crimes and throw assaults, <coughs> and it's going to reset everything downstream, and I can re-execute it and pull back another chart for assaults, right? So if I wanted to get a little more complex and throw in some loop structures and that kind of thing, I could have it automate this process and give me back a chart of every crime per month according to these categories. These images can then be, as I said, piped out to reports, and I can set up the report structure so that it's got a placeholder for each of these charts for each category, and it's just going to generate this report and throw those images into it for me. Like I said, that's the fastest introduction to time I can possibly do. That's sort of the basics. If you, do you have any questions? No? Kind of the wheels churning at this point? Um, you can see some of the ideas that be popping up in your head now about data manipulation. Data manipulation, automated reporting, yep. um, doing some advanced an analytical reporting doing some of these predictive stuff. I mean, it's a, unlike a lot of stuff that's um, out there, this is not a tool that does a particular thing. It is really a, they call it a workbench because it's just a set of tools that can be applied to any problem area. So there are people in um, all sorts of different industries that are actively using NIME. They use it in the pharmaceutical industry to do chemical modeling. Um, they use it in the banking industry to detect fraud in credit card transactions. They use it, which this is one of my favorites, they use it in the gaming industry to do real-time predictive analytics on gamers' behavior behind the scenes. So when you have these online games, actually watching millions of users simultaneously play a game and then change the game environment based on their interactions. I think that's pretty cool. That's sort of mind bending. Um, well, the, the good thing about it is you just start small. You know, you don't have to get complex. Just let it do a couple of things and build into your knowledge of it. Yep. So to follow on that question, then, so you showed us how to patch an R snippet in there, but can you do the reverse? Can you invoke nine from some other process? So you've got a user running something. At that point, you want to analyze some data or whatever. You invoke it. And and bring the results back into some other environment? Yes. Um, so they have a concept of calling a NIME workflow using 
um, a URL with mm -hmm. parameters. Mm -hmm. So you embed that URL in a live resource, and then every time somebody touches that resource, it runs the workflow back and throws the visualizations or whatever it is mm -hmm. um, back to the caller. So that could be a computer program that throws a, a parameterized URL at NIME and gets something back in order to run its own processes, mm -hmm. or it could be something like a refresh on a web page. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we come to the exciting part, right? Um, getting this on the, the polygon level or the GIS level. I fought, worked with Skip for the last couple of years. We fought with the whole um, the shapefile implementation in NIME in lots of different ways. And then lo and behold, somebody out there in the community, literally about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, Simplified that whole process down for us by producing these shapefile readers and these polygon property nodes. Um, I don't have time. I can tell you all the crazy things that we threw at shapefile. You got to realize, <laughs> whole, yeah, any type of workaround you can come up with, we've uh, tried it. Yes, um, and so, it worked. Oh, it worked. It, it worked. worked. Just, but now I can do it with a single node, um, which I'm very appreciative of. The, this workflow, we said we can draw it in from different resources. So this workflow, if you can, I'm trying to stand back here to see whether any of this is actually legible. Um, the top node is a file reader, so I'm going to read a flat file. What I did was pull down um, a flat file from the Board of Elections for Forsyth County registered voters and the voter history. Um, this one is going to read the registered voter data which is residing locally on my laptop. I then had a um, copy that Skip provided of the SQL backend for Forsyth County property tax data. So I've got all of the values of the data, the, basically the, the characteristics of the property. So this is pulling from a SQL database. And then this last one is reading the tax shape file. So it's reading the polygon level of all of the, the real property parcels for Forsyth County. Does that make sense? So I've got three different data repositories. I read them all into the same workflow. I've got to do a bunch of data manipulation um, on these in order to get them to do things like join the way I want them to join. That's not really exciting stuff. What I did do to take a lot of that out of play was that these gray boxes with the green check marks are called meta nodes. So one of the slick things about NIME is that if you create this big structure to standardize data, then we can collapse that down into a single meta node, right? An end user can create their own meta node, give it a name, we call that one the mega joiner, just because it was um, the link between these two disparate data sets and they had to join on a bunch of different properties. Um, that one meta node now is a single resource that I can define and pass off to other people. So if I wanted to say, hey, Skip, I found a way to, to do voter data and the property tax base. Um, I called it Mega Joiner. Here it is. I can ship that off to him, and he can use it. So I don't have to have all those other nodes going, what did you do, Mark? That's right. I can't follow all this, and it's all put down to one <coughs> node, so the other user can go, oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so walking it through it, we the, these top are cleaning and standardizing <coughs> the property base records and aligning it with the voter uh, registered voter data. I can then join those two data sets. And I've got a cross join going on here because one of the data qualities that I wanted to add in was whether or not these people owned the property that they're registering, they're voting at, or if they are renting that property, i.e. they're not the owner of the property. Right? So I wanted to add a new data element in so I just used the cross-joining capability, so now I've got a one-zero flag for owner-renter um, built into the resulting data set. Bridge those two, um, bring them together, I then join them with the shape file, and like I said, this used to be a, a massive collection of nodes. I now have two. This reads the shape file. This pops out some other polygon properties, like it'll add in the centroid based on the the shape file itself, um, join in the polygon properties. It'll allow me to color my data 
based on certain characteristics. You got to think about that as like a, a meta quality of the data now. So in this um, in this top line, I was interested just to see a geographic distribution of voters by party inside of Forsyth County. Right? Pretty it seems like a simple question. Um, the color manager I'll open that, allows me to pick the party. Party underscore CD is a BOE um, column that came out of their data set that has their party affiliation that they registered for. And I just told them I'm Democrats are blue, Republicans are red, um, unaffiliated are yellow, right? And then libertarians are in there in greens. And it adds that quality to the data set behind the scenes. So anytime I push that to an image, I can request that that color quality come out in the resulting image. So this is the map that results, which is each tax polygon that's filled in with the color of its party affiliation. Does that make sense? So to get where we're going with this, to sort of bring this back to the, the fat polygon, this is a pretty, um, I don't want to call it mundane, but it's a pretty simple exercise in terms of taking these two data sets. But really what we're after from the big picture is that you continue to layer data set upon data set into this fat polygon environment. And now you can start to look for all sorts of correlations amongst data, right? Um, not something that we've built here, but some of the things that I'm personally interested in are things like uh, social and cultural behavior inside of boundaries. Um, where are people investing? Where are, the, where are the trendy areas inside of the county based on new commercial investments? Um, how does that correlate to things like crime um, or investment in cell towers or other types of other artifacts of human behavior that now all of that data exists? It's just how do you bring it together? How do you bring in health and human services data and layer that on top of it in order to answer other questions? EMS information, bringing that in and talking about um, responses of roots, doing some medical um, type analyses of these data. That's all possible. We just wanted to, to show that you can start building these basic layers of data on top of this geospatial backbone. Does that make sense? Where we're going with this? Um, so as an alternative, since it's still voter data, right, those are just party by party affiliation. Um, all you have to do a little bit differently, since you've done all this work in the, the front end, you can take that work back into another branch. And in this instance, I took every polygon inside the county and just said, okay, where are our registered voter density? So now we get a map where blue are registered voters, white are properties that don't have a registered voter attached to them. And we can start to look at um, voting tendencies across the county. And of course, there's going to be some correlation to residential areas, right, as opposed to commercial areas. The park, right, that's in the middle is fortunately um, absent of any registered voters. Things that would be indicative of, of problems in the registered voter database. But you could do that kind of analysis as well. And then because it's also um, of interest in the, the county GIS world, we took the same backbone again. and went through and just looked at the density of property values across the county. So this is a heat map. The darker red are the, are the least valuable properties. The, um, the greens are the more valuable properties. Um, I know it's kind of hard to 
privacy from the back of the room. But the concept again was okay, so we can join all of these qualities. You can start to imagine now layering those qualities. So if we want to look at, um, I don't know, um, voter registration and um, property values, like how those are distributed, um, that would be interesting. Registered voters um, and property values might also be interesting, starting to feel apart. You know, some behaviors around civic engagement, in other words, um, throughout the county, that might be interesting to some some elected officials inside county government may be interested in some of those kind of analytical reports. Um, anything that gets added in becomes a new data quality. In other words, you could do the opposite of what he did. You know, he's showing the values of the properties. What about delinquencies? You can look at patterns in that way, just using different data. Boom, there you go. You can start looking at your patterns on that. You know, bringing this layer in and turn around and put the next layer of over it. You can see, well, okay, delinquencies and property value, how they correlate. So, I mean, Nom just makes a good tool to help you put this data together for you from separate, unjoinable data, I mean, from its own, its own sources. So as another aside, um, this was a this is an example workflow that comes off the example workflow server. It's also a little hard to read um, from the back, but essentially what they've done is they've taken a data set here, and this um, I think is if I get these so this is pushing it through JavaScript and using a, an API with the Google Maps. Um, so leveraging some of their GIS data into this analysis. But here it's going to be um, not as interesting because what they're actually doing is restaurants. Um, but it's the same concept. They just went and did it a different way. If I can get it below, um, there's a warning on here. You know, the, the downside of doing live demos is that it's a because it's a Google Maps, it's what they call a lazy load, so it actually has to make a call out to the Google servers. Um, and I'm on wireless, so it may or may not load. But what this, yeah, okay, we got that part. What this drops is um, pinpoints for every location. So if you imagine using this other kind of workflow to do things like pinpoints on delinquencies, um, then that would be a, a, a quick application use of doing this and then doing that on a regular basis. The hardest part about analytics and reporting in the past has been that it's very time intensive. So what we're looking at now is if somebody wants to see delinquencies on a monthly basis, you set up a workflow like this on an automated server that's going to grab the data, run the analysis, generate the report, and send it out, which is how we consume this internally quite a bit for management reporting. Um, because there are reports that people want on Monday morning when they're strategically planning their week on how they're going to operate. So our NIME server internally delivers those operations reports um, every Monday morning in the AM hours into their inbox so that they're ready to go. Um, it's just a really it's a powerful tool as opposed to having analysts can start thinking about new ways to produce useful information and actionable intelligence as opposed to going through the process. Of they can actually the analyze <coughs> instead of type all day long. Yes. Right. So he's going to another part other than the open source. He's going to the NIME server, which automates everything for you and all that. Um, you can talk more about that, which I'm still on the open source tool because I basically don't automate things. You know, if I need someone to run it, I usually pass them that. Now, Forsyth County has been looking into getting into NIME server, our tax department. So when that happens, then I will start publishing my workflows that way. But for now, basically I run the workflows. But like I said, Mark, if you need to talk more about that, Mark's the man to talk to about the NIME server and everything. So. 
And it's really not that expensive compared to what you can get with it. Let me ask a question. So, so we, um, think about it. so I work in the enterprise jazz department. So, a lot of times we get requests to do these kind of maps, you know, kind of above and beyond special analytical type maps. <clears throat> so, we could set up a nine process that would basically do whatever we wanted using our statistics. And then have those outputs put into a map. And then we'd be able to take that whole workflow and give it to these individual users, whether it was in environmental health or whatever, or tax or whatever. So that then we're able to kind of empower them to run those same things over and over, correct? Yes. Yeah. And one of the, so one of the, I don't think it's immediately apparent, but one of the things that I find very valuable about it is that if you have, so one, everybody has some siloed data. Right. So being able to access silo data and bring it into one analytical environment is fantastic. What we tend not to have because of legacy um, data stores and control systems is any sort of history that exists, right? Because data gets overwritten in place um, and then we can't go back and see what the past is. If you have something like a an automated process that's running, that's grabbing the data anyway, and part of pushing it out is pushing it to a static data storage, which could be as simple as a flat file, right? So sales is usually an issue in assessment databases um, because they overwrite, they they're only keeping the last sale. Well, implementing this and grabbing a monthly sales report, then you get a monthly snapshot of all of the sales. Somewhere inside of this nine workflow, you're pulling in all of the sales for that month and you just write that out to a separate data store. So you get that in a flat file, so it's kind of the, the offshoot. And then you're allowed to, I mean, at that point you're enabled to go back and do the um, more of a year-on-year -year sales perspective for the county. Testing. Thank you. <laughs> what direction are we going in, et cetera. Does that make sense? So that, that, is that a node to write the data out at a certain step, or does it do it automatically? There you go. Uh, it is a, there is a set, of, there are a set of nodes. Uh -huh. um, so if I come back to my library, um, there are database nodes to go and write to database structures, like SQL database structures. Um, there are nodes to write to flat files. So we may be writing in something to, as simple as a text file or a CSV file and using that as a data storage, um, data store. Um, or you can, there are things to support XML files if we're pushing it out that way. Um, you can write the text files. I don't, there's so much you can do. Sometimes people just have to tell me to stop. Um, but you could write that text file to look like an XML file structured like an AT, a, a, HTML page, right? Um, and store the data that way. There's just a lot. And when you say SQL, you mean, you just mean a SQL compliant database. I'm sure it's data. I mean database. Yeah, I was going to say yes. something with that. I have a workflow right now that I pull in data from a Postgres SQL database, uh -huh. a Microsoft SQL database, an Oracle database, and also a flat file in one process. I bring it all together. So yeah, I mean, it, like you said, compliant, it doesn't really matter. You just, what flavor? It all comes in. And that one process is pretty important. It brings in all that data into that one process and just goes, what's work? Yeah, the, the techie side of it is that it's written in Java, so you get the JDBC driver yep. for whatever database you're using. <coughs> Luckily, every major database brand out there supports JDBC drivers, so that part's pretty easy. Um, and then you can get more creative with it, depending on how, how much redundancy and backup you want in the, way, the ways and the places the data is going. So that's throwing a lot out there. I did want to add one more piece, um, if you have the tolerance for it, which is the predictive analytics side for those people that are in analysis. Um, it Nine's does, a smart thing. What's that? I said Nine's a smart thing. Nine is a smart thing. Um, it's a smart tool. So if we go, this is just an example um, of what could be done. This is the same voting um, data. Polygon um, that we were using, <coughs> but what I did was take a top branch off and do a little bit more um, data manipulation. Added some qualities to it. Had a
calculate some things like the distance from a, a static point, which I just chose the city center. Um, Highway 52 and Interstate 85 intersect at one point in, in about the middle of um, the county, so I just chose that as the, the centroid for the county, and then did a calculation for every polygon's distance from that centroid. Uh, anyway, added some data qualities to it. What NIME has is a, a set of uh, machine learning nodes, and machine learning very quickly are their algorithms, statistical algorithms. Um, that can be applied to data using a different sets of logic to look at future probabilities. Um, in this case, it was a decision tree, if you're familiar with any of these, um, a decision tree predictor node. And applying that to the voting patterns, you can actually come up with a, a fairly reliable pattern, not based on what we would normally equate with voting registration, but just looking at the property data. So if I look at the um, square footage of the home, the last sales price, the um, distance from that centroid, some other property type characteristics, I can predictively determine which party somebody's going to belong to. Right? So these have these kind of patterns of predictive analytics have all sorts of applications in um, government work, not just around voting, but Skip and I have talked in the past about doing some things about economic development, looking at dollars in and um, the way that that develops a particular community, um, school radii, so trying to pull in some shape files around school districts and that type of thing and the way that this um, correlates with investment in property or cell tower placement or resource use. Um, there's just there's so much wonderful stuff that can be done on that level. Um, so with that, I don't know if you have any closing remarks, Skip, but we wanted to open it up to, to Q and A for at least a few minutes. Anybody have any questions? I mean, I know there was a lot to absorb here, but just trying to give you some ideas of what really NIME can do. And you got to realize, hey, it don't cost you anything. It's, it's open source to start playing with. Now, granted, like I said, uh, you start your division, you say your, your company, or not your company, but your organization starts getting in deeper with NIME and coming up with your own processes, and you might want to consider getting to a NIME server. So then you have that ability to set it automatically up and everything. To run processes, or say your your clients or your other colleagues from departments can just push that one button, let it run, and get the report. Now, that's the power of nine server. But to get you started, workbenches, like I said, it's great. Start small. That's what I did. I started small. You might want to consider by getting the books from Nine Press. They are great books. One says, uh, "Was it best luck or good luck?" But really, it's a good book. I advise you to pay a little extra for it to get the three-year subscription because that's what I did. And I've already got I'm on my fourth book already. You know, they updated with the new new stuff that NIME can do. And this is a, a very active community. And this is a very progressive piece of software. There is people really contributing to this. Just like I said, Marcus found this less than four weeks ago. Shake bottles. You don't believe how much that just saved us from doing something from all this hard work about we did. But if you do any type of data manipulation, and yeah, you can do this in SQL, SQL language and stuff sometimes, not all of it, but to be able to check your work while you're doing it, and then you go, wait a minute, I made a mistake. And you don't have to worry about messing your data up from the beginning. You can just go back to that and go, dang, I'm stupid. You fix it. Run it again. Um, that's the only comment I have. And really serious. Any questions? I would download it just to play with it. Because I have had some people just, I talked them into it. They're like, oh, I never use this. They love it. These data driven people that have to mess with data all the time. I used to not be that way. I am now. I got forced into it. Yeah, smile up, Joe. There we go, camera off. Not yet. <laughs> oh, good. I can tell us one more time now.
But um, 